Hello, I'm Scott DuPont with another episode of Finance Your Movie, sharing tips and strategies to help you fund your independent feature, documentary, short film, or web series. Our mission is to empower you to get your money to tell your story. Okay, I'm very proud and happy to have Matt Miller with us. A uh, little over 10 years ago, Matt started a company called Vanishing Angle. And what's remarkable in, the, in that short amount of time, Matt's done almost 60 projects. And what's really cool is this week, Matt has the number one comedy, the number one horror, and the number one indie film in theaters and VOD. What do you say yeah. after that? <laughs> that we got very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot, lot of hard work. Um, so we've got a really packed show today, guys. Really excited Matt could join us. So we're just going to jump right in. Um, Matt, you were, um, you, you came out of film school and you started doing tons of first and second AD work, correct? That's right, yeah. And what was very interest, an interesting decision, I, I think it was probably one of the best decisions you made of your life, but you might not have known it. You chose not to join the DGA. Why? Right. Um, the DGA has strict rules about what types of films you can work on. I mean, essentially, if it's a DGA film or not. And because of the um, budget thresholds, you know, most independent lower budget films cannot be a DGA project. They just can't meet the minimum payments for their assistant directors or directors or UPMs. And so it limited the types of films that I'd have the ability to work on. And my whole goal at that phase of my life was to figure out how to make films economically. I just felt like I would have more power to green light my own projects if I understood the nuts and bolts of how a project got made. And so to understand that, I felt like I needed to understand how lower budget films were made. And so I knew that if I joined the DGA, then I wouldn't have the opportunity to work on those lower budget films. Um, but the other sort of benefit that came from that, that I hadn't quite planned on, but um, really allowed me just a different access level is that I had all these non-union assistant director credits. So when I went to a studio film, it made me like a very clear candidate to work as what they call the key set PA, which is like the first non-union position under the AD department. And so I kind of had my like pick of the litter to say like, hey, I wanna work on this film. And they would often be like, well, you're completely overqualified and we're gonna underpay you. And I'd be like, well, I don't mind because I wanna work with Clint Eastwood or Gus Van Sant or you know, Sean Penn or whoever it was, um, Christopher Nolan. And so like, it just allowed me this greater access because I, I never joined the DGA. And so Vanish Angle kind of came as a, amalgamation of everything I learned in those two different worlds, like what were economic films doing to keep costs so much lower than studio films. And then the specific studio films I worked on, I, I got to see like, well, what, what drove these films to be a little bit more um, marketable, a little bit broader aspects, like why were they successful on the studio level? And so that's sort of how Vanish Angle came to be was, was my education in those two worlds and saying like, okay, how do we make educate uh, like economical films, but have them be marketable to a broader audience. And you and I both both got the privilege to work on a couple of Clint Eastwood films. If anyone has that opportunity, Film School 101. Oh my That's God, crazy. I it's learned like so much. Yeah. yeah, we still try to apply so much of that to what we do today. I mean, one of the number one things is just the length of his shooting days. He shoots, you know, we'd wrap every day by lunch and um, we still eight or nine hour days sometimes with Clint. Oh, I mean, I, I had a day we came in and we shot one shot and went home. I think it was a five minute day. <laughs> <laughs> so um, coming coming out of film school, you did what's really a, a typical career path for successful um, producers. You you started out your career doing a whole bunch of short films, and I, I want to take a quick sidebar to this because and, and we'll get into the financing in just a minute. But there's one other route that some folks uh, might want to do, and that's they might want to try to work with a production company like Vanishing Angle. And let, let's say they're not in Hollywood, so Vanishing Angle is not really an option for them, but they want to work with a local production company to finance one of their features. What would you stress the importance of, of doing some quality shorts and commercials 
uh, to show that production company to kind of back into them eventually doing a feature and backing them. Sure. This is from a director standpoint, you mean? Yeah. Let's say a, a young, a young kid at a film school, he, he's been out a couple of years, he's doing some shorts, he's doing some commercials and he wants to get a, a, a production company like Vanishing Angle. Yeah. Say, hey, I really like your work. We're going to green light you a $200,000 feature. Sure. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I'll always say directors an entry level position. It's like the one person on set who doesn't need to have any film experience. And I know that sounds crazy because they're the helm of the ship, but as long as they have a clear vision and a good set of communication tools, like really anybody can direct a film. That said, uh, there's a lot of elements that sort of make it easier if they've done other projects before. So first there's this sort of like just getting everybody on board of the project. And if, you know, it takes time for everybody to read a script, to decide whether to do a project. And if you have a short film that you can show people that's like, okay, instead of taking two hours to read the script, watch this five minute short film, and that can inspire them to then read the script or, you know, scripts are really kind of awful documents. Like they're, they're like a blueprint for a film, but they're not really that enjoyable to read. It's hard to sort of get a sense of what the script's gonna be if you can't get a sense for what the vision of the director is. And a lot of times if you watched a short, it's much easier to bridge that gap between what it looks like on the page of a script and what that final vision is gonna be. And so that's a huge part of it. Now for us at Vanish Angle, we took a different route in terms of curating relationships with directors. And that was doing a short film or a commercial with them first to get a sense of how they work before we do a feature with them. Because to us, and this is one of the things I learned doing these more economical productions is that it's not one size budget fits all, you know, and that there are these certain thresholds we wanna keep within in order to be um, fiscally responsible within the film. But at the same time, if we know how to best build a budget around the way a director works, it's just gonna be a more successful project. So we'll often work with a director on a short film or commercial, and we can tell like, okay, this director needs a lot of takes on set, or this director needs a lot of production design, or this director has a long post-production period and we need to buffer that out. And that way we can set our budgets with what we call priorities. We can say like, okay, within the budget, this thing needs to be a priority and we can, these things are lesser priorities. So we don't have to allocate as much financing towards them as we do towards these other things. And we can balance the budget out for the most amount of success. Per perfect fit for, for you and the, and the director. Yeah, that's, that's the way we look at it. And we found a lot of success that way. And, and for us, it also helps build the long term of a career. Like almost all of our directors, we've done multiple projects with. Well, Jim, Jim Cummings, like over 10 projects, yeah. right? I mean, way more than that. So Jim, we first uh, collaborated with on his short film for Thunder Road. And then after that, we did nine more short films before doing his feature film of Thunder Road. And then we've done two other features with Jim since then, plus a handful of even, you know, commercial projects, smaller things. So, you know, we're probably 15 to 20 projects deep with Jim at this point. And that's after having produced with him as well. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so from there, after doing all these shorts yourself, getting back to your path uh, as a producer and Vanishing Angle, around 2014, um, I guess were your two first features, Amira and Sam are the dramatics. Can you talk a little bit about one of those films and, and how you, I'm, I'm guessing those were micro budgets under 200,000? They were, they were pretty low budget. And uh, how, how did you get the money? How did you get uh, those things equity. put together? It was equity based. So, uh, you know, our sort of take on putting together films of, you know, especially a first time feature, we usually go after equity and, and we go after venture capital and it's, it's a very sort of easy pitch on our end. It's like, you know, certain net worth individual is going to invest in 10 things of those 10 things, five will lose money, three will break even, two will hopefully pay for the rest. That's, you know, and what we say is like, listen, just as a starting point, film's risky. Imagine we're one of the five that loses money, like just out of the gate. But what's different than the other things you might invest in venture capital is that at the end of this, you'll be able to come to set, you'll be able to say you're a producer on a film, you'll have a poster, you'll get to go to a festival premiere, you'll get to have a DVD. And now like we can pretty much guarantee it's gonna at least end up on Amazon. And so that's the worst case scenario. So you're getting all this other stuff that you wouldn't get in any other venture capital situation. And then from there we say, okay, if that's the worst case scenario, here's also why we think you'll be, this will be one of the ones that at least breaks even and possibly one of the ones that makes money back for the rest. 
And even with our first films, that was sort of our pitch. And even though we didn't have a track record, um, we had a good reputation from working in the industry and I had a good understanding of the economics of film that just other people in our playing field didn't seem to have. And so it became very easy conversation with um, on the equity side, especially something sort of at that range that like, you know, for a $200,000 film pulling in five or six investors, like that amount that they have to invest um, at those levels is, is you know, and, and the type of net worth people we were talking to then, it, it was an extreme risk. It was like, yeah, you could- They lose 25 or 50,000, it's not, it's not gonna put well, them in the poor house. And the other thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that uh, it's so hard to talk about, but there's a tax code called section 181 that gets retroactively renewed every year, which allows you to write off your investment in film. And so depending on an investor's involvement in the film, they can either write off active or passive income. Yeah, they need a tax write-off. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Section 181. Section 181. And and the tricky thing about it is like they always retroactively renew it every November when they have their session. And so you can't guarantee it to an investor, but you're just like, pay attention in November. They retroactively renewed it for the past 15 years. They'll probably do it again. And usually by the time you get to January, you can write all that off. So like for a lot of people, it's sort of a win-win. It's it's like, you know, whether they were going to donate to a favorite charity that year or donate to a bunch of filmmakers, it's kind of the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, and you, you might have learned part of this from working on a Clint Eastwood set, but just really your philosophy, which I really respect, by the way, is you want a vanishing angle to have this, this culture like this, this family where everybody's treated with respect everyone's a collaborator there's there's none of this hierarchy where you have all the above the line people at video village and you know somebody's afraid it's like hey there's there's a problem with this shot it's like i'm not going to tell them are you going to tell them and it's like this this whole thing this no diva policy and talk about how that what you've created leads to many of your crew members and a lot of your team becoming your biggest advocates, supporters, and really ambassadors when you're out there raising money. Well, and listen, like we often said, like culture is not something that's just altruistic. It just makes better business. I mean, any business book you read, it's going to tell you the same thing, that if people want to be there to work, they're going to create better products. And then and in a creative industry, that's tenfold. Um, and, and that just became clear. Yes, like you said, the, the sets I was fortunate to work on, whether it was working on Into the Wild with Sean Penn for eight months and seeing how every single crew member believed in Sean, believed in that film, believed in what we were doing, or working on the Clint Eastwood film, where people have so much respect for Clint and his legacy in Hollywood, that that drives everybody to be the best that they can be. And so what we've always tried to do is like, obviously, especially from the beginning, we didn't come to the table with that legacy that a Sean Penn or a Clint Eastwood has. But what we could come to the table with was a mutual respect for individuals and say like, we're going to always respect the fact that a crew member is a person first and a crew member second. We're going to respect the locations we're at and the neighborhoods we're shooting in, the communities we're a part of. And yeah, creating that family atmosphere because there is like people joke, there's a little bit of a band of brothers things that happens when you're working on a set together. Like it's hard to make a movie. You're working 12, 14 hour days. Sometimes it's, out, um, out of town for months sometimes. Out of town for months, you're working in extreme conditions of cold or heat. And so the thing you have to rely on is the person next to you. And so we've always worked very hard to, to create that family atmosphere. And that, that goes back to the shorts and commercials. That was another thing that was really important to us is that we would use the same crew members on all these different projects, whether it was a short film or commercial, and that we try to bring them all onto the features that we did. And then one of the things we started doing very early on as a company is that we'd have some sort of get together or party every quarter of the year with anybody that we'd worked with that portion of the year. And so like in the spring, we do a really silly prom usually. And then, you know, in the December quarter, we usually do like a pajama brunch for the holidays. Like we have a pumpkin carving in October. And then the summer is usually sort of a, a wild, like, you know, barbecue or we had a party with a bunch of puppies that crawled over people. We had things like that. So it's like these bonding experience. And then we can get to know their families and their families can get to know us. Cause again, there's the whole out of town aspect that like when we're asking to say like, Hey, we want your husband or wife or, or 
you know, father or mother to come with us on the road for four months. We want that family to be rooting for the film and rooting for us as people and know that they can also trust their yeah, yeah. parent to be with us. I, I uh, want to so talk a little bit um, about you. You've had several successful uh, crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah. And talk about how you transitioned some of those donors, either when the crowdfunding thing filled up or maybe you just bonded with some of them and you translated some of those into $10,000 or, or whatever cash amount investors. Well, you know, so it's interesting. So uh, yes, we did crowdfunding through uh, Kickstarter early on. And I think the most successful, well, we've always had a portion of our films that was crowdfunded. So like $10,000 here, you know, $20,000 there, even from the first films. And for us, that was helpful, not just for the additional financing, but for audience building, because if people, you know, give to a project, they become literally invested in it and want to be the first advocates for it when the film is released later. And it's a really easy way that if you're raising $10,000 on an Indiegogo or Kickstarter that, you know, 25 bucks, I, I want to cheer you guys on. Exactly. And then what happened uh, that was sort of special with Thunder Road is because Jim's short film of Thunder Road had gotten such notoriety uh, on the internet through social media and people just loving the short, when we launched the Kickstarter for that, which was the plan to do the same way of just this tranche of our raise through Kickstarter, people contacted us outside of Kickstarter and were like, we want to be actual investors in this film. We, we love everything that J Jim is doing. We love Vanishing Angle. How do we have a larger contribution? And we were able to translate what started as crowd equity into actual equity investment or crowdfunding into equity investment. And then the later part of that is as we were making the Wolf of Snow Hollow with Jim, uh, Jim came across this platform that was crowd equity called WeFunder that was not set up for film. It was set up for just general equity investments and decided to be like, think like the second film ever to go onto the platform and basically say like, okay, no more Kickstarter, no more just donations that you get a t-shirt for instead we're going to give the opportunity for anyone you know to be yeah they could all be investors exactly and we raised for that film we raised three hundred fifty thousand dollars in 12 days uh, and i think we had like 263 investors or something like that quick quick uh side note on that i i heard there was a bet in the office like right. okay we have three hundred fifty thousand dollars to raise yep. and you're like oh i bet we can do this in six months i bet we can do this in 90 days you were the one that said like 10 or 12 days or something. I said two weeks. You said was, two weeks yeah. and so you got I, it done in 12 days. Yeah. There was a, people were going against me. There was people who were like four months, six months. <laughs> I, was like, I really think we can do this in two weeks. Knowing Jim, the, uh, the eternal optimist. The eternal so, optimist. so a uh, quick, quick side note. If you want to hear the whole kind of behind the scenes on how they did that raise $350,000 on WeFunder. Go to episode number 203. That's the second season. And Natalie Metzger dives really deep into that. So um, jumping to another thing that you've been successful at, you've been, you've been fortunate to have many repeat investors or several repeat investors. Yeah. How is that? Is that because the way you treat your investors or your culture? I actually think it's more culture based than financial based. And that's not to say we haven't done well financially, but I don't think we've done well enough that that's the only reason that people want to invest in this company. For us, the same way we treat our crew members as you know part of the family, we, we feel the same way about investors. Like they should feel comfortable with what they're being a part of. They should come to set, they should get to know us. A lot of investors that even from the early films have become friends, you know, friends first and investors second. Um, and then on top of that, we do, we have just been lucky in this industry that we've hit the zeitgeist at the right time and been able to return to people. But I really think more important to that is the experience they have out of participating in a film, because ultimately yeah. that's that's what they're supporting. They want to be part of a team. They want to be part of a of something that has value to it outside of the financial value. And that's the sort of beauty of film, you know. So one one of the things I wanted to circle back to is it's it's always a challenge. In fact, one of the toughest things is to get a potential investor to sit down for three or four hours or two, two or three hours and read an entire script. I mean, yeah. everyone's time is valuable. A lot of times I don't even give the script to a potential investor because there's just one more. But you and Jim came up with like this unique hack. How you're like, can you, can you share what you're, what you're doing with that? 
So I believe what you're talking about is our audio scripts. Is that? Yes. Is yes. It? Yeah. So uh, I got to give a lot of credit to Jim for this. We actually started doing it early as a company for table reads, but Jim was the first one to really sit down and, and take it to the next level, which was we'll have the, the writer or director read the entire script from start to finish and play all the parts. And then we'll add music and sound effects to it. And it essentially becomes what we can call a podcast, which everybody sort of knows that vernacular and say like, okay, listen, we know you don't have two hours to read this script. It's going to be a slog, but in your car rides, listen to this for 90 minutes and you'll get a feel for what the film is. You'll get a tone for what the film is. And especially for someone like Jim, that the comedy is so nuanced to be able to hear Jim's cadence when he's reading it. Yeah. It, it, like you really get a sense for what the rhythm of the film is going to be and you get much more excited than, you know, the sort of dry document that a, a screenplay is. And yeah, we've had a lot of success with that. It's a great, great tip. When I, I heard that on your South by Southwest panel, I was like, wow, what a, what a great idea. So it's not as hard as people might think it is, especially again, like it's one person reading it. It's just simple sound effects and music to sort of keep the momentum. And it's really sort of a fun way to make your movie before making the movie. Yeah. What would you say to, um, to, to people struggling to get their first feature financed or maybe their second or third film, the importance of going to film festivals to, to network oh. with different people? Yeah, I mean, it's the most important because that's, that goes back to the community aspect of it. I think there's a misconception that going to film festivals, you're gonna get your film financed that way, that you're, you know, someone's gonna see your short or you're gonna meet someone at a party that they're the ones to sort of write a check for you. And for us, it's less that, it's more just being part of a community of filmmakers who you can then collaborate with on your other projects. I mean, I met Jim Cummings and his partners in crime, Ben Wiesner and Danny Madden at through a film festival. They had seen a film I produced called In the Family. And then that's how we all got involved together. Natalie Metzger, who's our VP of production development, we met at the Hollywood Film Festival. Um, and it's become all this like, you know, a snowball effect of people who are like-minded that think the same way about making movies that you guys sort of all grow together. And now we have this large network. And then even within the film festivals, you know, people say, people talk about the um, success of Thunder Road, the feature winning the grand jury prize at South by Southwest and this sort of overnight success of Jim Cummings. And the thing I'd like to point out is that that team between Jim, Ben, Danny, myself, Natalie, we had had something play at South by Southwest the previous 10 years in a row. Like, and whether it was a short film or a feature or one year- That's amazing. Bumpers, that like by the time we got to handing in Thunder Road the feature, which was an excellent film and deserved the grand jury prize, we were also primed for success because everybody knew this group, whether it was the programmers or the audience or yeah. the other filmmakers, and everybody saw the film and was inspired by it, but wanted it to succeed at the highest level, which it ended up doing with the grand jury prize. and so you know, it looks like overnight success, but it took 10 years to, to curate. I, I like the fact what you said uh, a few minutes ago, one of the first things you, you bring up, even when you're talking to one of these high net worth venture capital guys, like, hey, there's unique risks oh, yeah. with this film project. So you, you get that out of the way. That's, that's yeah. the, you know, you gotta be, it's, it's gonna come up sooner or later. So you might as well bring it up first. Exactly. But you also said, you need a plan and you need resources, but you don't necessarily need a distributor. Do you, do you kind of share that with uh, potential investors in this kind of unique world? Because they might actually respect the fact that you're not like every other filmmaker in Hollywood. Just, yeah, we're going to knock on Netflix and they'll probably buy our film because they're buying everyone's film. Yeah. And we did that even before the distribution part of it, even the sales agent part of it. Like, I think there's a step that filmmakers think that they have to have a sales agent in order to get a distributor. And after our second film, after, you know, after we sold Amir and Sam, we went ahead and did the sales ourselves on the dramatics and then started really doing the sales on a lot of our films after that. And that's not to say we don't, we always do that. We don't work with sales agents. And the same thing with distributors, like we self-distributed a film. We did a lo loose self-distribution on a film called The Grief of Others. And then we did a wide scale theatrical release on this movie called Too Late. And then after that, when we got to Thunder Road, we basically were like, not only can we handle the distribution, we can do a good job with it. We can handle the sales ourselves. Why don't we try handling the sales internationally? And we just used this sort of, you know, what we learned from the previous five films to sort of do it all ourselves. And then now, yes, as part of our model when we're going out to investors is we often will raise an extra cushion of money so that if we get into that phase, where we're not finding the right distribution partner, we have the opportunity to do our 
themselves, it's, it's a great backstop. And it just makes the conversations easier of what the best outlet for the film is. And, and the way we look at it is that distributors are not evil people. I'm not anti-distribution. I, I actually love distributors, but I think you can make a better decision when you're evaluating it on the right terms. And you can say, where are they really adding value to this film that we're not adding ourselves? Is that worth the additional percentage that you're going to pay them? Is that worth, you know, and you don't necessarily want to get lost yeah, in, in a big that, distribution world sometimes. So we've got great distribution partners. Like we're releasing two films with IFC right now. They just released our film Werewolves Within. They're going to be releasing our film Beta Test. They'd also released our film Greener Grass. And they're an incredible partner. We're so happy to be working with them. But I don't think we would have had the know-with-all to, to come to them and tell them exactly what we were looking for in a distribution partner and then have them confirm that. Have we not been able to say, well, listen, with beta test, we can distribute this ourselves. We have the money to do so. What can we really get out of partnering with you? And then they could come to the table and really make that clear to us. Awesome, awesome film, by the way, Werewolves Within, directed yes. by Josh Rubin in theaters right now and streaming. Real quickly, how did that film come about? We were very lucky. We had just finished a movie with MGM called The Wolf of Snow Hollow. And the video game company Ubisoft had decided to start making films internally instead of working with studio partners. And they were reaching out to the studios to say, hey, listen, do you know any like indie filmmakers that can help us figure out how to make our first film? And MGM recommended us. And we just all hit it off. And we brought Josh Rubin, the director in, and uh, we helped them sort of work on the script some and start putting together the crew. And it was, you know, just sort of a dream collaboration with them. So, so MGM kind of referred you, but it was totally independent. Totally independent. Oh, through beautiful. Stuff. Yeah, they, they find beautiful. themselves. Well, congratulations on that. I hope everyone goes out and sees it, you know, this weekend or next week, as soon as you can. It's an awesome movie. Um, final thing, how do people get more information on Vanishing Angle or follow you? What's the best way? It's very easy. I mean, our website is vanishingangle.com. All of our social media is at Vanishing Angle. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So it's pretty easy to find us. We're very... Uh, uh, search engine optimized with a, a, a company named like Vanishing Angle. Matt Miller, all the way from Utah on the set of a different film. Thank you so much for, uh, for giving us a few minutes here and uh, we'll talk soon. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Scott. Tune in next week here for more info. Visit financeyourmovie.com. Thank you for listening. And remember, if you have a story to tell the world, never give up on your dream. Copyright Nemours Marketing.